Let's review what we know so far about groups. So we have the definition of a group. That's a set G with a binary operation with the properties closure, associativity, there's an identity, and every element has an inverse. And then we had some ways of classifying groups. We could classify groups as finite versus infinite. So for example, uh, an example of a finite group that we saw would maybe be uh, the integers and under addition mod n, something like that. Uh, and then an infinite group, well, we had a whole bunch of these. We have something like maybe the real numbers uh, under addition or maybe the complex numbers under multiplication. Um, these are all examples of infinite groups. Okay. And then we could also look at abelian versus non-abelian groups. So again, we saw a bunch of abelian groups. Uh, these guys over here could be abelian groups and complex numbers under multiplication and then there were plenty more. Uh, for non-abelian groups we just saw one so far, the general linear group and so this would be the group of n by n matrices with real entries and non-zero determinants and that was a non-abelian group. Now I want to look at another example of a group that is non-abelian. So what we're going to look at are equilateral triangles. So uh, that would be all three sides are the same and all three angles are the same. And we're going to look at three basic types of operations. And the idea is we're going to do things to the triangle that are going to sort of put it back where it was in a sense. So one of the things we could do is just plain old leave it alone. Don't do anything to it. And that's kind of a boring one, but it counts. It's something that would put it back where it was in a sense. Another thing we could do is rotate it. So that would be taking the triangle, rotating it around until it's back where it was. Or we could flip it, flip it around, and again, it'll be back where it was. So these are the three basic types of operations we're going to look at. So we're going to start with this uh, thing called a row with a little zero here. That's the Greek letter rho and then a zero. And we're going to take a triangle and I'm going to label the three angles, one, two, and three here. And so if you leave it alone, that would be just putting everything back where it was. Okay, row one. Now I want you to think of row as rotation. So we're going to take our triangle that we're going to start with and we're going to rotate it counterclockwise. So the one now is going to be over here, the two is going to be up here, and the three is going to be down here. And then row two would be to rotate it counterclockwise twice. So here's our triangle that we're going to start with. And it's going to end up looking, well, the one now is going to be up here, the two over here, and the three over there. That would be like rotating it counterclockwise uh, so that the one, you can imagine, it started here. This one right here went here and then all the way up to there. So that would be rotating counterclockwise uh, twice and so that it lands back on itself. Okay. Mu1. Okay, so this is going to be something a little different. We're going to take our triangle, and what we're going to do is we're going to leave this position in the bottom left hand corner here. We're going to leave that fixed. So we're going to keep the one right there, but we're going to flip the two and the three. Mu2, we're going to take the bottom right hand corner, this one right here, and we're going to leave that fixed. So it's going to look something like this the two stays there, and then the one and the three. Uh, flip places. In mu3, we're going to take the top and we're going to leave that fixed. So this right here, leave that alone, and then the other two swap places. So you can see the three types of operations here. The leave it alone type, well that's this one right here, that was where we didn't do anything. The rotations, where we rotate it around, that's these two right here. And the flips, well there were three ways to flip it, these are the three flips right here. So this uh, set of operations, I'm going to refer to this as S3. So that would be these six things that we've already looked at here. And these are going to end up being the elements of our group. What about the binary operation, though? What's that going to be? Well, 
You can think of each of these elements as a function on the set one, two, and three. So let me give you an example. Let's look at mu one. That was the one that left the bottom left-hand corner of the triangle the same. Well, that's the same thing as taking the one that was down here and bringing it to one. That one didn't change places, and the one is still there. The two now became a three, and the three became a two. So you can see how this is a function on the set of one, two, and three. And we know that if we have functions, a way that we can combine them in a binary operation, a way you can combine two functions is function composition. So the binary operation that we're gonna use is function composition. Okay, let's look at an example. Suppose we have row one composed with mu two. So that's the same thing as row one of mu two of x. What would that look like? Well, let's look at each of these individually. So mu2 was the thing that left the bottom right-hand corner the same. Remember, this is the thing that just stayed where it was. And the other two flipped. And then row one was the thing that did a rotation and it went counterclockwise. So everything kind of rotated in this direction. But remember how function composition works. We first are going to use mu2 and have that act on uh, each of the numbers 1, 2, and 3. So we're going to get this, and then we're going to apply row 1 to this triangle right here. So actually, this isn't a 1 here. This is actually a 3. This is a 2 still. The 2 is still the same. And this is not a 3. This is actually a 1. And so when we rotate it now, the 1 will be down here. So this is actually our 1. The 3 will be over here, so that's actually our 3. And the 2 will be up here, that's our 2. So the 2 actually didn't change. If we want to look at this in terms of the set 1, 2, and 3, let's see what happened. Well, if we look at where we started here, here's the 1. That's where the 1 began. And where did the 1 end up? Down here. The 1 didn't change. So 1 is mapped to 1. How about the two, where did that go? Well, here's the two where we started, and here's where it ended up. So the two did switch with the three, and that means the three switched with the two. What does this look like? This looks like mu one. That's where we kept the bottom left-hand corner the same and flipped the other two. So we can say that row one of mu two of x is the same thing as mu one of x. Or in shorthand, we can say row one mu two equals mu one. Now remember I said that this was gonna be a non-abelian group. So we just saw that row one mu two is equal to mu one. So let's check the other way around. What about mu two composed with row one? Let's see if we get something different. So that's the same thing as mu two acting on row one. And so let's look at row one, that's the thing that rotated everything counterclockwise. And then let's look at mu two, that's the thing that left the bottom right hand corner the same and flipped the other two. But remember, when we do this, we have to act on this triangle right here. Okay, so what did mu two do? That's the thing that left this alone. So leave this alone right here, this, this uh, end of the triangle. And then we'll see what happens here. So, okay, so we have to act on this triangle. So this is not a one, this is really a three. This is not a two, this is really a one. And this is not a three, this is really a two. I'm just using this triangle right here. And we're gonna leave this alone. So that's gonna stay one. And this is gonna flip. So the three and the two are gonna flip. So the two will be down here now, and the three will be up here. Okay. So let's see what this looks like when we look at the sets one, two, and three. So we started with the one here, and the one became a two. And let's see, the two became a one, and that means the three must have stayed where it was, and it did. The three, we started with it at the top, we ended with it at the top, so the three stayed where it was. This looks like mu three. So now we see that mu2 row 1 is mu3. And so in particular, row 1 mu2 does not equal mu2 row 1. This is a non-abelian group. Order matters. 
Okay, so now we see that S3 is a non-abelian group of order six. Remember, the order means the number of elements in the group. And it turns out that this is the smallest possible non-abelian group that you can have. So let's look at the group table for this group. So we know now that uh, row zero doesn't do anything. So any of these row zero times anything is gonna be the same. And by the way, since order matters, we need to be precise about the direction that we're doing things in here. So um, when I say that I wanna do, for instance, um, oh, we'll look at what we had before. How about row one, mu two? So row one, mu two, we saw that that was equal to mu one. So row one, I'm gonna start over here and then mu two, and so this will be mu one. Okay, so in other words, start on the left as the first thing, and then the top will be the second thing. Okay, so since this row zero doesn't do anything, I can just copy all of these down. That's gonna leave everything the same. And so I get something that looks like this for the top, and then I can do the same thing on the sides here. And that takes care of a good chunk of the table here. Now let's see if we can figure out anything else. Well, um, if I were to rotate twice, row one and row one, that would be the same thing as row two. It kind of makes sense, right? And then row one and row two should bring us back to where we were, so that should be row zero. Row two and row one, that sounds like row zero. And then row two and row two, if you think about it, would leave us with row one. Okay. Now, mu1 and mu1, well, if you flip by leaving the bottom left-hand corner the same and then do it again, you should be back where you were. So that should be row zero. Mu2 and mu2, same thing. And mu3 and mu3, same thing. All right. We also saw row one, mu2 is mu1. Well, I already filled that in. What about mu2, row one? Mu2, row one, that's mu3. Okay. Now we have to figure out the rest of these. And if you look across any row or any column, each element should appear exactly once. So we can use that information to kind of help us fill out the rest of the table here. Uh, so let's look at this position right here. So this, this would be row one, mu one. Flipping once and then rotating once. Uh, you can check this on your own, but I'll tell you that this ends up being mu three. And so if this is mu3, this has to be mu2 right here. Another thing is when we're doing a rotation and a flip, it's going to always be equivalent to a flip. So I can tell right away that this is going to be my mu2, this is going to be my mu3, and this is going to be my mu1. So this would also be in this bottom corner here would be a rotation and a flip. So I have the same kind of thing. So this must be mu1. And now I need to figure out one of these. I'll just tell you this is going to be mu1 here, and this will be mu2, which means this has to be mu2, and this has to be mu3. All right. Now we just have these right here. Uh, so again, I'll leave you uh, to check these on your own. This ends up being row 1 right here, which means this has to be row 2, this has to be row 2, this has to be row 1, row 1, and row 2. Okay. That's our group table for S3. Let's check and see if it actually is a group. Do, uh, does it satisfy the group properties? So first, is it closed? Yes, if you take any two elements in the group, you do get something else in the group. Is it associative? Well, we know that composition of functions is associative. So yes, I would say this is associative. Is there an identity element? Well, you might have guessed already that the thing that leaves the triangle alone, this row zero here, that's going to be our identity element. You can see that it doesn't change anything uh, when you act with it. So yes, it does have an identity. Inverses. Does every element have an inverse? So let's look at the rotations. Uh, row one and row two give the identity. So row one, the inverse of row one is row two, and the inverse of row two is row one. We see that here. What about the flips? Well, I think if you look at the flips, they're each their own inverse. If you look at mu1 and mu1, we have the identity. Mu2 and mu2, we have the identity. And mu3 and mu3, we have the identity. So yes, every element does have an inverse. So yes, this is a group.